Dear friends in Christ, we have a Lord who is life in this dying world. May he be your life and your strength for each day. Amen. About 20 years ago, there was a, still alive, an artist by the name of Lee Greenwood who produced a song called God Bless the USA. Now this is a country song, which usually I don't get an opportunity to hear country songs, but I heard this first right after uh, September 11, 2001. If you remember, there was a great deal of patriotism in our country at that time, and, and this song really is a very patriotic song. I, can, you, can you imagine otherwise with a title like God Bless the USA? In this song, one of the choruses that repeats over and over again is, I'm proud to be an American, where at least I know I'm free. And that, word, that line struck in my mind, because it is so true that as Greenwood said there, we are proud Americans who are free. We are proud Americans who celebrate the freedoms we have, uh, the freedom of speech, the freedom of, of religion, the freedom of press, the freedom to carry a gun, even the freedom to complain. Many governments around the world, they don't give you that freedom. If you disagree with the government, well, you better keep your mouth shut or you may be persecuted. But here in the U.S., if you don't like the government, if you don't like the way things are going, you can complain until you're blue in the face. But our unalienable, unalienable rights, we are given by our Constitution. We celebrate those. We celebrate the men and women who fought for those. From 1776 on, our country has celebrated the men and women who fought, gave their blood for the freedoms that we have here. And yet, here we are with such great freedom. So many great freedoms. And we live as slaves. We live as slaves in this free country. We live as slaves in the U.S. of A. that is freer than most countries in the world, if not all. And I'm not talking about being slaves to a diet where the taskmaster is, the, is Weight Watchers or doc, Dr. Atkins or your spouse. I'm not talking about being a slave to, well, to your government, literally bending that knee to whatever they say. I'm not talking about being slaves to your job where your boss is the taskmaster who rakes you do what you don't want to do or, or even slaves to your health where you're, you are bound by medicine or oxygen or doctors. I'm not even talking about being slaves to your own body as you have aged. The slavery that we're talking about here, the slavery that we suffer in this U.S. of A. and throughout the world is the slavery to sin. And this slavery is a very real part of our lives. This slavery is something that it's impossible to forget. This slavery is the truth of, for many of us, for all of us. Because when you look at your lives, we say, I'm a Christian. I'm here on Sunday morning and I'm celebrating God's word, his freedom for me. But look at our lives. Consider your life throughout this past week. Consider your life in the past 10 minutes. Are you truly free from sin? Can you truly look sin in the face and, and stare it down and turn 180 degrees from it in repentance? Not one of us here can, can we? We can't truly walk in those steps and say, I am free. We look at it and we say we're Christians. We go to church. We read our scriptures. We, we, we pray regularly. But is that what being a Christian is? Is that what freedom of faith is? Certainly not, because those are to-do statements. Whenever we talk about to-do statements, that is the law. That is what we are bound to do. So what does it mean to be a Christian? To be a person who has been set free from God? Well, first we have to know what it means to be a slave. First we have to know what it means when we look at our lives and we say that even though we are free from, from sin, that we still may laugh along with other people as they pass around that off-color email or, those, or hear those off-color jokes. We know that there are still those among us who will repeat that juicy piece of gossip, at, and we may not even stop them from doing so. We know that there's those among us who probably even this morning as they got cut off by that $50,000 SUV, gritted their teeth and thought some probably sinful things. We know that there's those among us who, well, whether or not it's outright or veiled, still have racism in them. That they look at people of different color skin, they look at people who speak differently and they judge them by that. And even if none of these are things you struggle with, not one of us can say we don't struggle with pride. That we are perfect in thought, word, and deed. Because here we sit and we hear those words 
we confess those words and we know that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We are not only sinners, but we are full of sin. We are not only guilty of God's law, but we have violated all of God's law. And we know that it's not just something that happens once a day, once a week, once a year. But it's something that's a regular part of each day. It's part of our lives. It's part of who we've become. And the devil, he works. He works constantly. He studies us. I would say that the devil is probably the greatest anthropologist in the history of the world. And an anthropologist is someone who, he, they study not only humans, but they study the, our behaviors. How we interact not only with one another, but interact in groups. And the devil, he watches. He looks at how we interact. And he sows his seeds of discord. He puts those seeds of distrust. When we are hurting, he puts those people in between us. When we are, when we are afraid, he takes away our trust and our safety net and makes us believe we are separated from God. When we are coming together and walking together as Christian believers, he separates us and knocks us out because the devil does not want to see us living as free people. The devil does not want to see us as Christian people walking in God's footsteps, carrying his banner. In the U.S., we have a banner for freedom. And we call it the flag. And we even have one up here in front. But in Christian, our Christian faith, we also have a banner. And we carry that banner. And that banner is the love of Jesus. That banner is God's love for us that ever goes before us. But so often that banner gets stomped on. It gets torn apart. It gets burned and thrown to the ground because we are by nature sinful and unclean paul says in romans chapter 7 and probably many of you will be able to repeat these words from memory i know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature for i have the desire to do what is good but i cannot carry it out i desire to do what is good but i i cannot carry it out take out paul's name there Place it with your own. I am Jonathan. I know that nothing good lives within me. That is, nothing that in my sinful nature. For I, Jonathan, have the desire to do what is good, but cannot carry it out. What about your names? Couldn't you put your name in that same sentence? We desire to do what is good, but we are unsuccessful. We desire to do what is good, but we are unable. We desire to carry out God's law in our lives, but our love is marred. Paul said in our, in our epistle reading for today that our love is the fulfillment of the law, but how often do we fail in that? How often do we fail in our love for one another? How often do we fail in our love for those in our church, in our community, in those who we interact with on a daily basis and around the world? How often does that love, though, fail for God? Because even before Jesus gave us the command to love one another, he gave us the command to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And we don't, do we? We don't because sin continues to live within us. We don't because that sin continues to operate and it continues to tear us away from God. We have a God who constantly comes to us. A God who forgives us of our sins. And as soon as we're forgiven, we go back to those sins. A God who takes away the aches and pains of this world. And we continue to seek the aches and pains of sin. See, sin is like a cancer that is growing within us. If you are familiar with cancer, you know that it, it starts out undetectable at first. It starts out as just one or two little cells changing inside the body. But over time, it grows quicker and quicker. And as it grows, it gets faster and it's changing. And that cancer, until it riddles the whole body, if it goes unchecked, will grow until it takes over. And that is exactly the way sin works in our hearts and in our lives. It starts out small, undetected. Maybe a little lie here, a little half-truth there, a short piece of gossip there, or a little curse word here or there. But over time, it just starts to balloon. It starts to grow inside of us. It starts to grow until we cannot eat, sleep, or live without sin in us. Until our entire bodies are riddled with sin. Until our entire bodies are separated from that freedom God has given us in the gospel. We know this to be true, don't we? We know this in our lives and the lives around us. We celebrate the freedoms that we have in America. We celebrate with joy 
Many of us this, in three days will we'll have barbecues, we'll sing patriotic songs, but we know that there's still a slave master who we have not beat. There is still a slave driver who continues to twist and turn our lives away from God. There is still a slave master who continues to breed pain and ache. And it would be easy to point our fingers and say it's the government's fault. It would be easy to say it's the president's fault. It's, the, it's everyone else's fault. It's the Supreme Court's fault. But the truth is we know that our sin is no one else's fault. The sin that lives on in our world, that lives on all around us, it is our own fault. Our sin is our own guilt. Our sin is that which separates us from the freedom of God. And there is only one cure for that sin. There is only one cure for that cancer that lives within us. Because while there is no cure for cancer on this earth, no permanent cure, there is a pure permanent cure for our sin. And that pure, permanent cure is our Savior, Jesus Christ. Because He went to the cross and He shed His precious blood. He knew we needed a blood transfusion. Our blood was, bro was tainted and it was dirty. It was stink, it sp stunk of our sin and it smelt of the rottenness of our souls. And Christ, He gave His blood on the cross and transfused it, changed it with our own so that we might know forgiveness, so that we might know true life. Because as long as we had that sin living within us, as long as that sin controlled us, there was no life for us. But when Christ died on the cross for us, when he bled for us, when he gave his life, he did so so that we might have life. And so that we might have life to the fullness. He did so so that we might live with true freedom. Not a freedom that is more laws. Not a freedom that says if you don't do this or if you don't do that, you cannot be my child. But being a Christian is not what we do. But it is what has been done for us. Being a Christian is what Christ did on the cross for us. And it is knowing with full assurance that that payment was enough. More than enough for all of our sin. Being a Christian is knowing that on this side of eternity, we will continue to break the laws of our Lord. We will continue to fail to keep his commands. But knowing that we have a father in heaven. Who does not look at us with that old stinky blood. But with that new fresh blood of Jesus that was shed for us. We have a father who loved us so much. Because isn't that exactly what he said the fulfillment was of the law. Because that's what Christ did to pay for our sins. He fulfilled the law perfectly in every way. He lived out the law in ways that we never could. He kept God's law. Jesus, even though he was put into terrible situations, even though he was tested and tried to, time and again, he never turned his back. But he lived the law in a way we could not. So that we would know, not a master in heaven, a master who has wrath or anger, but a father in heaven. A father in heaven who loves his sons and daughters. Because that is who our God is. That is who our God is who has given us this true Christian freedom. And what does it mean to be free in Christ? Yes, it means we're still sinners. Because Christ didn't come for the sick or for the well. He came for the sick. But it also means that as people who, are, who were sick, though that, is, that means that as people who were not well, that we can relate to those who are sick. We can relate to those who don't know Jesus. We can relate to those who are lost those who are dying. We can relate to people who don't speak the same language we do. We can relate to people who don't have the same skin color we do. We can relate to people who seem to be opposed to Christianity in every way, shape, and form. Because at one time, our hearts were opposed to God. We're opposed to salvation in every way, shape, and form. But even in those times, even at that time, our Lord called us. He called us to salvation. He called us to be His own. And he called us so that we might go and we might share his love with others. That we might take advantage of the freedoms we have in this country to share the good news that Christ indeed lives and that Christ indeed has forgiven each one of us. Christ has conquered sin. He has conquered death. And he has given us the promise of salvation. That is the hope that lives within us as Christians. That is the promise that burns within our hearts that we know to be true. That as Christ rose from the dead, we will rise from the dead. As Christ defeated death, we will defeat death. We will not end in pain and death but we will end in righteousness. We will end as the victors. 
That is who our Savior is. That is so, that who, the, what our promise is. And that is the hope and promise we have to share. And if that doesn't burn within you, I don't know what will. Because if that doesn't stir you up with the hope and knowledge that our Savior lives and our Savior can defeat death, I don't know what will. Because nothing else can change us but the gospel message, the love of Christ Jesus in our lives. And so I hope that as you say, I'm proud to be an American, at least I, where at least I know I'm free, that you also might say, I am proud to be a Christian because Christ has made me free. Say it with me. I am proud to be a Christian because Christ has made me free. Amen. Please pray with me. Dear Lord Jesus, we give thanks to you that while we were yet sinners, poor, miserable sinners, you defeated death. May we now know the freedom to live as Christian people. May we go forth sharing your love, sharing your promises, and sharing your truth. Lord, help us to not look back on that old life, but to ever go forth knowing that sure promise that you have made us free. May we walk as people free from sin, free from death, free with the knowledge of life. This we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.